Why don't you grab your seats? We're gonna jump into the word together. High five somebody. Zero high fives. That's okay. One. Somebody probably just did this. They didn't high five anybody. They just clapped on their own. We're about to jump into the word. It's one of the things that we do as we gather um, as the body of Christ, the congregation of the peoples. We love the word at this church. We live by it. It's, it's the final authority in our lives. It's the highest authority. We submit ourselves to the truth of Scripture in the process of sanctification. And we, we desire to see God and who he is. God, his nature, his character as revealed in Scripture. That's, that's what we do. We're not just here for like Bible lessons and like TED Talks. So you can go, mm, that was really good. You write it in your notes app. But that we would be changed by the word of God. Yeah, amen. Shape our lives. Mold us and turn us into the version of ourselves that God created us to be. That's sanctification. A great friend, a brilliant Bible scholar who said discipleship is the process of becoming who you already are. It's becoming who I am in Christ. That's, that's discipleship. It's the process of becoming who I already am. So I'm glad that you're here and we're gonna jump into scripture. We've been in this series called Theologies. Am I at the front or am I at the back? Oh, no! What do I do? Make it go to the beginning. We've been in this series called The Ologies, and we are going through some of the fundamental doctrines of our faith. And we've gone through our bibliology. It's our doctrine of scripture. We've gone through theology, our doctrine of God and the Father, Trinitarian theology, we've gone through Christology, pneumatology, our anthropology, our doctrine of man and civilization and culture. Why do we build these things? Anthropology, um, our homardiology, our doctrine of sin, soteriology is doctrine of salvation. And today we are in eschatology. And the church said amen. Everybody's like, oh, bro, I got a day off tomorrow. I can't with these words. Eschatology, I said, I said a five-syllable word to you, and some of you just like checked out. And it's been my it's been my aim in this series to take things that might seem intimidating in scripture and to make them accessible and enjoyable. So my favorite professors, my favorite teachers, that's what they did. I, I switched, I was a finance major, and I switched to economics of financial markets because of a professor. And then the content was fun too. But because he took things that seemed really complex and he made them both accessible and enjoyable. And an English teacher do the same thing in high school. And so that's been my aim here. And we're asking ourselves the question, why, why do these things matter? It's talking about eschatology, which is our doctrine of end times and eternal states. Like eschatology, bro, like, why are we talking about eschatology? The world is crazy. Can you help me navigate the world? My kids are wilding out. My marriage is tough. I hate my boss. Show it. We're talking about eschatology. Because these things matter. These things matter. What we believe about the end times and eternal states. And if, and if when I say eschatology... Like some of you guys who have grown up in church, you're like, oh, we're going to go through like a timeline. When's God going to open the seventh seal? When's the blood going to pour out? <laughs> we're going to talk about eternal states. Today is in some ways a defense of the doctrine of hell and an appeal to you with the doctrine of heaven. If you want to know eschatologically on like the end of the world stuff, we stand with 2,000 years of church history that we're in the tribulation right now. Yeah. We're in it. Jesus will return one time at the trumpet blast, the great and terrible day of the Lord, and the day of judgment, and we'll receive our crown. Boom, timeline, there you go. Let's talk about eternal states. We talk about eternal states because these are the questions that are on people's minds. You know what your unsafe friends aren't asking? Hey, are you like mid-trib or like post-trib? Or... <laughs> not asking that. They're, they're important conversations to be having. But I, I want to be after the questions that people in your world are asking. 
and, I, and I'm going to make a defense of the doctrine of hell against some, some TikTok theologians that, you know, if we, don't, if we don't ask these questions in church, if we, if we are not ready with a defense of the faith, people are going to other places for answers. So it's a defense of the doctrine of hell, an appeal from heaven. And I pray that our understanding of the depths of darkness, that it wouldn't end in despair. It wouldn't end in like being afraid of the dark, but that it would put a longing for the light on the inside of us. As we understand the nature of sin, the weight of sin, the weight of darkness, that it would put a longing for the light on the inside of us, that it would light a, a passion and a fire on the inside of us for people that don't know Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Eschatology, Dr. Van Times in Eternal States. Let's say the Apostles' Creed together. I'm going to move the table. They keep telling me this whole side of the room can't ever see the TV. They're like, do you even care about people or just your table? I'm like, my table, okay? <laughs> move that. But I would love, because we have been starting every one of these this summer, and we're, we'll conclude this in a couple of weeks, um, by reading the Apostles' Creed. And I, I want us to say it together today. The, the 12 articles of faith in the Apostles' Creed are the foundation and the, and the guardrails of our theology. And so I'd love for us to read it together. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead us in the reading. Would you read it out loud? We'll say it together. Those of you online, say it in your living room. The Apostles' Creed goes as follows. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Church, pause for this cause. This is small c Catholic, means universal church. I believe in God's holy church. Resume. <laughs> the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the Apostles' Creed. Literally billions of people have confessed these words. You are bigger than, you're part of something so much bigger than yourself when you're part of God's great church. So let's talk about the doctrine of eternal states. So we're going to talk about hell, and then we're going to talk about heaven. Got some questions. We're going to talk about hell in the form of some questions. God's not afraid of your questions. And just because you have questions doesn't mean you're deconstructing. You're allowed to ask questions. But the way we ask those questions and where we ask them is important. How are you asking the question and who are you asking it to? God's not afraid of your questions. How do you ask them, though? Are you asking a question to uncover truth or are you asking questions to prove a point? Because they're very different. We ask questions to uncover truth. Truth is not something we design. It's something we discover. Truth is not something we create. It's something that's revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. So I'm asking questions to uncover truth or to prove a point. How you ask them is important and where you ask them is important. Ask them of scripture and ask them of the church. If I have cancer, I don't ask my mechanic. I ask my doctor. Why would I ask somebody who's not part of the church, who doesn't love the church, my theological questions? Just because you have questions and hard questions doesn't mean you're deconstructing your faith. It means that you're in pursuit of truth. It becomes deconstructing when you're just trying to tear stuff down. But if you're having real questions about, about difficult things in Scripture, you know what you're doing? You're growing. That's right. That's right. So I've got some questions about hell, questions that I've had to wrestle through. I take no joy 
And no one who truly understands the goodness and the grace of God takes any joy in talking about hell. I've had to wrestle through questions first as a young man and then as a pastor, how do we pastor people through these questions? I'm gonna post my notes because we have tons of citations and tons of scriptures that we are not gonna have time to read. But they've been posting all of my notes to our Facebook campus and you can check all the citations and I pray that we would have a church that was like the Berean church that searched the scriptures to prove what the apostles said was true. To go, wow, there's an interesting thought. And then you go grab the notes and you pull all the scripture references, you pull all the early church citations. But here's some questions I got about hell. Does hell exist? A lot of TikTok theologians telling you it doesn't exist. Jesus didn't talk about it. Nobody, nobody talked about hell in scripture more than Jesus. What is it? How is it described in the Bible? Why is it eternal? This is a big question right now. And then the one that's on most of our minds. Why would a loving God send people to hell? You know why we're not talking about timelines and the moons and the blood and the seals? Because nobody's asking that. They're asking this one. This is the hardest one. It's the hardest one for me. But truth wins. Some of y'all tap that on your forehead. Truth wins. Pastor Kevin Gerald says, truth is not something you design, it's something you discover. And I pray that some truth is revealed to you. And I pray, I pray again that as we talk about the doctrine of hell, that it doesn't lead to despair. Jesus talked about it a lot. And it shouldn't lead us to despair. It should, it should put a longing for the light on the inside of us. I didn't appreciate a tiny sliver of light until I was in insane darkness. We took a team a few years ago. We've planted a lot of churches in western Kenya. And Tia was with us and um, a few other people who are in the room or online were probably with us. And we were in um, just outside of a, 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 a city, probably 30 miles in West Africa, out, or West Kenya, out in the bush. And there's no electricity for like tens of miles. So when night came, it was the most breathtaking landscape have you ever been in an environment where there was like very little light pollution and then the star, you can like see the Milky Way? Like those long exposure photos. You're like, how'd you do that on your iPhone? But it's like a 50 minute exposure. It looked like that in real life. I was like, there are so many stars. <laughs> People are like, yeah, duh. I'm like, no, there's like so many. <laughs> and then one night it was cloudy. No light from the stars. No light from the moon. And it was the kind of dark that I've never experienced before. It was terrifying. Noises that I'm not familiar with. I'm like, we don't have that animal in Spokane, whatever that was. They're like, it's a cricket, bro, calm down. Like, it's a leopard. I know a leopard. I've seen National Geographic. But it was like so dark that you couldn't, you couldn't see your hand. You would go like this, and I could not see my hand. Not even like it was hard to see. I could not see it. That's how dark it was. So then to, like, go anywhere, they would give you a little headlamp you put on. And headlamps, like, I'm standing on a stage. It's like a lot of electricity around us and a lot of lights. If I had a headlamp on, it would not make that much of a difference. But when it was that dark, I had never been more thankful for a headlamp. Part of what I'm trying to do here today is paint a picture for you of the darkness of hell. Because we live in a day and age where we have lived in the light for a, quite a long time. Both non-believers and believers are like are living in the blessing of the grace of God right now. And we live in a cultural moment where we have to talk about sin because people have a hard time believing that sin exists and evil exists. There were generations that had no problem believing evil exists because they read in the paper where people were getting killed in gas chambers. Yeah. They're going, oh yeah, evil exists. But we have lived in the light and in the goodness of the grace of God in the West. Yeah. Not perfect. Right. We know that. <laughs> but we have lived in the light of the goodness and grace of God for so long that we haven't experienced darkness like hell will be. 
And so we have a hard time appreciating the light that is heaven. But I pray as we talk about hell that it wouldn't lead to despair, but that it would lead to a longing for the light. Does hell exist? Let's ask some questions. Alistair Begg said this, is Jesus Christ true in what he says? I love it when you ask a question and someone asks back. Jesus did this all the time. Does hell exist? And he goes, is Jesus Christ true in what he says? Because if Jesus Christ is Lord, then I have to believe exactly what he taught. If we start from that premise, then we can't simply excise the hard parts out of it. We got to take him at his word. And then he said this, the most loving person who has ever lived is Jesus. Love embodied. The most loving person that has ever lived spoke so straightforwardly about the awfulness of hell. Does hell exist? You could ask a different question. Well, first I need to know, is Jesus Lord? Because if he's Lord, then I gotta believe what he says. And the most loving, hear me, the most loving person in the history of the world, love embodied, and all these notes and citations will be available after this if you're having trouble writing. I know I see a lot of people like take pictures and stuff, take notes, do your thing. But the most loving person who ever existed spoke so straightforwardly about the awfulness of hell. And we gotta be careful that we don't think we're more loving than the perfect embodiment of love. He understands love more than we ever could. And we sing that and we celebrate it and then we try and redefine it. But the most loving person who ever lived was like, yo, it's awful. Does hell exist? We gotta ask the question, is Jesus Lord? Because if he's Lord, we gotta take him what he says. What is it? You get annihilationists that say you just cease to exist. You get some people that say you're there for a certain amount of time based on how, how many sins you committed in this earth. For 2,000 years, the church has taught that hell is a place of total, conscious, eternal separation from the blessings of God. And if a person rejects God all throughout life, never submitting to him in repentance then that person will enter eternity after death without God. So how is it described in the Bible? It's described as darkness, gnashing of teeth, which is a way to communicate intense anguish and suffering. When do you gnash your teeth? When you're, when you're like, you know, when you just, you know, that's when you gnash. It's not a sound so much as it's what you do when you're, it's a place of intense suffering. Fire, it's described as. Separation from God. Darkness, from the oldest book of the Bible, which is Job, to the last book of Revelation. Darkness is consistently associated with hell. Job writes of a, quote, land of deepest night of utter darkness and disorder. That's Job 10, 21 and 22. A realm of darkness, he calls it, Job 17, 13. He even calls it a day of darkness, a never-ending day of darkness, Job 15, 23. Other references to darkness throughout the Bible include Nahum 1, 8, where he calls it a realm of darkness. Matthew 8, 12, Matthew 22, 13, Matthew 25, 30, Jesus says they will be thrown outside into the darkness. Jude, in Jude one thirteen, he calls it the blackest darkness. Revelation 16.10 says that they'll be plunged into darkness. Gnashing of teeth, Jesus, who spoke about hell more than anyone in the Bible, used this phrase to describe the intense suffering in hell. Pray that as we understand the weight of the darkness, it doesn't lead to despair, but it leads to a longing for the light. Jesus warned people about the place where, quote, there will be gnashing of teeth. Matthew 8, 12, Matthew 13, 41, 43, Matthew 13, 50, Matthew 22, 13, Matthew 24, 51, Matthew 25, 30, and Luke 13, 28. Put that in your theological pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Jesus talked a lot about hell. 
Why? Because he loved it? No, because he needed us to know. Jesus isn't just a life coach. He didn't just came, come to make you better at your thing. He came to save you from the wages of your sin, which is death. Fire, it's described as. Isaiah in the Old Testament prophesied about hell as the place where the fire that burns them will not be quenched. It's Isaiah 66, 24. That unquenchable fire is also referenced in Mark 9, 43 and Mark 9, 48 by, guess who? Jesus. People are like, well, he said Gehenna. It was a place where they burned garbage. Yeah, that's the closest thing he could. It doesn't mean he's gonna throw you up the garbage. It means you know where stuff is, is burning and diseased bodies are burning and there's worms? It's, that's the, the closest thing I can think of to describe it to you. Other references throughout the Bible include a blazing furnace. That's Matthew 13, 42 and Matthew 13, 50. The fires of hell, Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, 22 and Matthew 18, 9. Eternal fire, he calls it. Matthew 18, 8 and Matthew 25, 41. And Revelation 14, 10 says, they will be tormented with fire and brimstone. Four, it's a separation from God. Often without knowing it, both the redeemed and the unrepentant experience God's blessings on earth. The only thing from keeping this world being consumed by the depravity of humanity is the grace of God. The grace of God is the only thing keeping evil at bay. The grace of God is active right now for both believer and non-believer. People ask the question, why do bad things happen? We could ask the question, why does anything good happen? Because the grace of God is holding back the utter evil that is perpetuated by the ruler of this world. And hell is eternal separation from God's grace, his presence, his love, his blessings. Here are Bible passages describing the reality of hell as separation from God. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 says, quote, they will be shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Matthew 25.41, Jesus says, he says, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25.46, then they will go, to, go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous will go to eternal life. Which led me to the question, well, why is hell eternal? And Russell Moore wrote an essay arguing these two things, because sin is more serious than we realize. Some people will tell you that the amount of time you might spend in hell is due to, like, did you step on a grasshopper or did you kill somebody? It's like, did you get five years or did you get, like, triple life sentence? Nowhere in Scripture is that even a thought. It's, it's, it's eternal. Why is that? Well, sin is more serious than we realize. Humanity's rebellion against God is more serious than we realize. An insurrection against an infinitely holy and worthy creator is an infinitely heinous offense, he writes. So why is it eternal? Because sin, sin is way worse than we realize that it is, which is also what makes the goodness of God and the grace of God and the cross of Jesus Christ infinitely better than we could ever imagine. Because he defeated death, hell, and the grave, and he freed you from the shackles of sin and your slavery to sin, and now he calls you saints. And because sin doesn't disappear. Those in hell do not love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and mind strength. But they're completely handed over to the fullness of their human nature without God's grace. The condemnation continues for eternity because the sin does too, he argues. Hell is the final handing over, like Romans 1. He handed them over to their desires. Hell is the final handing over of the rebel who wants to be. Why is it eternal? Sin is more serious than we realize, and sin doesn't disappear. He argues that the day of judgment is the final handing over of the rebel who wants to be. Which leads us to the question, why would a loving God send people to hell? R.C. Sproul said this is hell fair I don't think hell is fair well God who is drawing us to him over and over and over all through he's, he's preaching he's proclaiming 
all of creation declares the glory of God. He is always beckoning by his Holy Spirit. R.C. Sproul argued, no matter how we analyze the concept of hell, it often sounds to us as a place of cruel and unusual punishment. Like as I'm reading that, you're like, hmm, that's kind of harsh. It often seems like a place of cruel and unusual punishment. And we're not into that. Cruel and unusual punishment. No, no, no. That's not how we roll. R.C. Sproul argues, if, however, we can take any comfort in the concept of hell, he's like, if there's any comfort to be taken, we can take it in the full assurance that there will be no cruelty there. It's impossible for God to be cruel. Well, hell feels kind of cruel. It's impossible for God to be cruel. Cruelty involves inflicting a punishment that is more severe or harsh than the crime. That would be cruel. Your kid didn't eat their dinner, so you ground them for six months. Oh, that's kind of cruel. The punishment didn't fit the crime. Some parents are like, it better be a year. <laughs> you know when you're a kid and you're, you get in trouble, your parents be like, what should your punishment be? You're like, no, don't ask me that. <laughs> if you overshoot it, you're just toast. But if you undershoot it, you're getting, it's getting even worse. You're playing this like, what are the odds game with your parents. <laughs> what are the odds this one's right? so proud of you that you chose grounding. Good for you. I'm like, yes, I got it. <laughs> Cruelty involves inflicting a punishment that's more severe or harsh than the crime. Cruelty in this sense is unjust. God is incapable of inflicting an unjust punishment. Yeah, it seems kind of cruel. It's only cruel if the punishment is worse than the crime. And so the punishment should tell us the weight of the crime. The judge of all the earth will surely do what is right. No innocent person will ever suffer at his hand. As R.C. Sproul, one of the greatest theologians, one of the greatest theologians 20th century. It's a sense in which hell is people getting exactly what they want. You're like, can we talk about heaven yet? Oh yeah, we're getting there. We're, we're going to talk about the crown, baby. It's coming a day when the king, your king, is going to put a crown on your head and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Yes. There's a sense in which hell is people getting exactly what they want, if you think about it. Why would God send them? He didn't send them anywhere. They got what they wanted. If a person rejects God all through life, never submitting to him in repentance, God is always calling. He's always beckoning. Then the person will enter eternity after death without God. Instead of why would a loving God send people to hell, a different question could be asked, why would a holy God invite sinners into heaven? <laughs> you could ask it that way, but we don't. Earth is the one place that we get to choose whether or not we submit to God. It's the one place. All will submit to him as Lord at some point in their existence, either on earth and receive heaven or in hell, where he is still Lord. Scripture seems to indicate that God basically says, like, okay, I've shown you my goodness and grace, and you don't want that. It's totally your choice, and you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want with Jesus. You can do whatever you want with the grace of God. But being outside of my goodness and grace in eternity is utterly devastating torturous, lonely, and a deeper pain and sadness than you could ever imagine. That's why Jesus is the picture he's trying to paint. We know from Romans 3.23 that everyone has sinned and stands condemned before a holy God, but John 3.16 and 17 tells us that because of God's great love for the whole world, he stepped in to rescue. Yeah. He stepped in to rescue people. Yeah, Jesus is not your life coach. He's not your life coach. He's not the one who tells you how to do your thing better. He is the one who came, lived, died, and rose again that you would be free from your sin. From, from slavery to your sin, from the weight of sin. He, the wages of sin are death, but he paid the full price so that you and I could live in the fullness of the kingdom of God. He stepped in to rescue people from this helpless trajectory, and all we got to do is trust in him. But this rescue is not forced upon us. It's received by grace through faith. And should someone die without faith in God, the Bible says their sin, 
Their sin, why would a loving God sin them? The Bible says their sin has condemned them to hell. It's devastating. I hate it. But you know what it does? It makes me long for the light of heaven to be revealed in my world, to be revealed in my relationships. When I ponder the depravity of hell, it makes me want to be the world's greatest living evangelist. It shouldn't lead us to despair. I pray that, that you don't leave here fearing the dark, but that there's a longing for the light in you. You are the city on the hill. You are the light of the world. Jesus says to the disciples, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. The church, Peter tells the church, you are a chosen nation, a royal priesthood. You're a peculiar people. Peculiar means different. You're, you're built different. You're set apart for service to the king in his kingdom. So let's talk about heaven. What is heaven? I know the last time you pondered heaven. I think it is one of the most common tactics of the enemy to keep us so focused right here that we forget to lift our head to Zion, as the psalmist constantly says, to lift our head to the mountain, of, to lift our head to where our help comes from, to live with eternity in mind. That's why your eschatology is important, because we're in the end times right now. As soon as Jesus is sent to heaven, boom, end times started. That's been the teaching of the church for 2,000 years. In the mid-19th century, John Nelson Darby gives us all this other stuff, and it can't, Revelation and Daniel can't mean to us what it didn't mean to them. There's a little scriptural interpretation tactic for you. It can't mean to us what it wouldn't have meant to them. So we're living with eternity in mind because he could return at any day. And so I'm living with eternity in mind. I'm living with, the, with, with Christ in me, the hope of glory. That there's a day where I'm going to stand before him and he's going to go, well done, good and faithful servant. You did it, bro. I'm like imagining, looking Jesus in the face, he's like, you did it. I prayed for you. Jesus, his ministry right now, between his ascension and his return, his ministry right now is to be seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on the behalf of the saints. That's what he's doing. He's praying that your faith wouldn't fail. And I believe, I'm just gonna, he's gonna look me in the eyes like, I've been praying for you and you did it. Now receive your crown. Enter into my glory. This is heaven. What is heaven? We're going to look at it in these five, in the next 77 minutes that we have together. No, I'm kidding. It'll, be, it'll give me 12 minutes. It's an old, it's an old preacher joke. What is heaven? There's levels, bro. Let's talk about it. We're going to talk about heaven as God's dwelling. We're going to talk about the kingdom of heaven, which is a present day reality. And we're going to talk about heaven in the afterlife, which is a future reality. And then the new heaven and the new earth. So what is heaven? There's levels, bro. The Hebrew mind divided heaven into three regions. The air the birds flew in, where the sun, the moon, and the stars were at, and then where God was, which was utterly transcendent. You're like, cool fact? This is important. Because there are false teachers, false prophets right now who are trying to take shots of the doctrine of heaven by saying they were talking about the sky where the birds are. No, they were talking about that, but they were also talking about the place where the sun, moon, and stars were, and then also above that, like where God existed as this transcendent, like all of it was up there. So just because sometimes the word that's translated heaven means where the birds fly, that is not part and parcel. That's not all of it. And there are people who are taking shots at it saying, well, heaven doesn't really exist. When they say heaven, they meant where the birds were. Yes, and where the sun, moon, and stars were, and where God existed. There's levels. So where are we going to go? This, this transcendence. Not in the Buddhist Eastern sense. We'll get there in a second. 
But yeah, it was talking about where the birds were. Yeah, it was talking about where the sun and moon was. But it was also used in reference to where God is, which all in a Hebrew mind, all they could imagine was something so completely other than them that it was out there somewhere beyond even the sun, moon, and stars. It was the dwelling place of God. For the ancients, the third level of heaven, this is where Paul says I was caught up into the third level of heaven. He means I wasn't sitting on Mars with Elon's car. I wasn't parasailing with the birds. He was like, I was where God dwelled. The scripture says the third level of heaven. It's not like, the, like Mother Teresa's in the third level and like your pastor's in the second and you snuck in the back door to the first. It's not that. We receive our crown in that third heaven. The dwelling place of God or the gods. Don't let this freak you out. This is other heavenly beings. God, and in the Old Testament, God is, he, his name is El Elohim. Elohim, if you see little g in your Old Testament, that's the word God. There are other gods, other, other uh, spiritual beings. Some of them rebelled and followed Lucifer in the rebellion. And, and they now organize things behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. They're pushing governments, pushing ideologies. And you're like, Did I, do I go to a conspiracy theory church? No, that's a historic Christian worldview. God is El Elohim. He is the God of all of that. He is above them all. He is the one who orders the heavenly host. The council, it is him. He is El Elohim. The third level of heaven. We have a hard time with that because we have such a materialist, materialist view of the world. But there is a spiritual realm. It's, it's, it's Augustine city of God. It's the same actors, the same stage, the same play, and the same lines. But God is telling a very different story than the world is. It's Augustine's city of God. This third level of heaven is beyond the sun, moon, and stars. While eventually it came to be thought of as a spiritual place, it was still like up there, higher than the heavens. In Psalm 11, 4, Psalm 103, 19, and Isaiah 66, 1, we read that God's throne is in heaven. In Isaiah 6, 1, Isaiah has this beautiful vision of the throne room of heaven where the cherub and the wings are covering the feet at the throne of God. And they're circling the throne, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And Isaiah's like, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. I am a man of unclean lips. And they reach and take coals and cleanse his, it's, cleanse his lips. It's this beautiful picture of the throne room of God in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah sees God sitting on his throne high and exalted. In 1 Kings 8, 27 through 53, Solomon identifies heaven as God's dwelling place. In the beginning of that passage, Solomon acknowledges that even the highest heaven cannot contain God. You cannot contain God, Mike. You can't do it. The psalmist says, where could I go to escape your presence? I could go as far as the east is from the west and still you'd be there. He says, I could even make my bed in the underworld and you would still be there. God is even Lord of hell. In Matthew 13, let's talk about the kingdom of heaven as a present reality. Matthew 13, there are a series of parables. Most of these parables start with some form of the expression, the kingdom of heaven is like. This is heaven as a present reality. For the most part, they're not what we might expect. Rather than describing a future abode for the believers, a future home, they describe heaven as a present reality. It's the kingdom. The kingdom has come and it is growing. And one that is worth all we have. The present reality of heaven is the kingdom of God is worth all that we have. It's the pearl of great price. Jesus tells a parable about the kingdom that it's a pearl of great price. That somebody found a pearl in a field, and he returned home and sold everything that he had to buy that field, and he uncovered the pearl, and he had this treasure. That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is worth everything that we have. It's worth every ounce of our energy. It's worth every ounce of our affection. It's worth every ounce of our time, our talent, our treasure, all of it. To have the kingdom of heaven and nothing else is to have everything. 
Oh, that that would come alive in us, church. To have the kingdom of heaven and nothing else is to have everything. How about heaven in the afterlife, the future reality? 1 Corinthians 15, 35, 37 through 37 tells us that we're going to experience the future reality of heaven in the afterlife. We're going to experience it with transformed bodies, not like disembodied spirits. Just like, you know, floating around, like playing a harp, like, ring, ring, like, hey, Jeff, you're like, <laughs> transformed bodies. We will in some way be like Christ and in some way we'll be like the angels. It's a mystery. The pains of this life will be left behind, Revelation 21.4. Believers from every nation will praise God together. Kingdom of heaven is a diverse place. Every tribe, nation, and tongue. I'm going to caution you against people who are super obsessed with making every single local church diverse. It's contextual. The, but the kingdom of heaven is diverse. Yeah. God's church is diverse. Yeah. Yeah. Some physical cities are more diverse than others. But be careful not to disqualify a place or put something on to people that God is not. The kingdom of heaven and God's church is diverse and every nation, tribe, and tongue that will call on the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior and we will worship together. And I can't wait to hear songs and languages I don't know. You ever heard someone praise God in Spanish or in French or in German and you have no idea what they're saying but your spirit comes alive? That's because you're tasting the throne room of God as they are declaring the holiness of God in their own language, your spirit knows it. And we will be with the Lord forever, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, and we will share in the glory of Christ. But what heaven itself is like is really unknown. We, pearly gates and streets of gold, used to describe the new Jerusalem, which is adorned like a bride as she descends in Revelation 21. You have beautiful imagery, church. Art is yours. All you artists. Hey, you artists, go make great art again. The greatest art in the history of the world came from the church. The worship team said amen really loud from the side of the stage. Hey, you artists, go make great art to the glory of God. Bach considered himself a theologian. He was trying to communicate scripture by music. It's like, what, what do I feel when I read this passage? I'm gonna compose something. His art was, was, was an apologetic. It was defense of the faith. I don't know why I'm talking about that. What heaven itself is like is unknown. 1 Corinthians 2.9 does give us a clue, though. It says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what new, no human mind has conceived, those are the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Heaven is so incredible. You haven't seen it. You haven't heard it. You haven't tasted it. As incredible as you have ever imagined it, you're not even close. Not even close, bro. There's like a Dunkin' Donuts next to a Krispy Kreme next to a Starbucks. It's better. What God has prepared for us is beyond our ability to grasp right now. It's indescribable to our human minds. So John just describes what he's seeing as close as he possibly can. He talks about seeing Jesus. He's like, his eyes are on fire. Are his eyes actually on fire? No, that's just the intensity with which the glory of God was beaming out of his eyes. He's like, it was like they were on fire, bro. <laughs> but our human minds are so incapable of understanding the glory of God. So while we may not know what heaven is like, we can look forward to it with expectation and joy. And then in closing, Romans chapter 21 one through five, the new heaven and the new earth. John, this is the end of his vision. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away 
and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Any of you wedding photographers, you know you get to capture that moment of the first look. The bride adorned for, you brides, you who have been married or you who dream about it, you dream about what you're gonna wear, what your hair's gonna be like, how you can do your nails. And then you dream of like that look on your man's face when he sees you for the first time. And like the manliest man, I don't care. Every time I do a wedding, I go, you're gonna cry, bro. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. And I look over, he's like. <laughs> like a bride adorned for her husband, the new Jerusalem descends. It's beautiful. We've received our well done. You did it. Your faith didn't fail. The odds were stacked against you. Culture was stacked against you. Sometimes it felt like your own mind was stacked against you, but you did it. Yeah. You fought the good fight. You kept the faith. Now here, receive your crown, enter into my glory. And we're just in awe. The scripture says, John saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out, out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. The full display of the glory of God dwelling among us. If you remember in scripture, Moses is like, hey God, show me your glory. God goes, not a good idea, bro. But if you kind of look away, I'll show you my back. Because the fullness of my glory would consume you. Not in the new heaven. The fullness of the glory of God dwells among his people. God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Every tear. Death shall be no more. O oh, death, where is your sting? Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. fullness of the glory of God descends. He says, you tell him this, John. You tell him this. New Jerusalem comes down like a bride adorned for her husband. And I and all my glory will descend and I will dwell among you. And I'll wipe every tear from your eye. There will be no, death shall be no more. There will be no sickness. No strife. No disunity, all of the isms that bother you, it won't be there. Yeah, right. Anytime God heals you in your body, we believe that God heals. We lay hands on the sick as we're called to do, bring them before the elders, anoint them with oil, lay hands. And anytime God does heal, it's a glimpse of heaven. Yeah, it's a taste of the future that will come. Anytime God provides for you financially, it's a taste of heaven. Be careful not to get so obsessed with the miracles that you miss the one who is bringing them because it's all pointing to him. When he calms the storm in your mind, it's a taste of heaven. Marriage is reconciled, it's a taste of heaven. The former things have passed away and he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. And also he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He goes, John, John, you make sure you write this down. What I'm showing you right now, you make sure you write it down. Because there's going to be some people in September of 2021, the world is going to feel like hell. And they're going to need to see a glimpse of heaven. John is, John is, 
her Jesus, the letters that he's written to the seven churches. He's seen this incredible imagery of a final battle and of Jesus returning on the, the great and terrible day of the Lord. But at the end, he describes heaven. He says, you make sure you tell him this part too. You make sure that you tell him that my glory will descend and I'll dwell among them. And I'll wipe away every tear. There'll be no mourning. There'll be no sadness. There'll be no pain. Because there's some people that are going to be mourning and they're going to be sad and they're going to be in pain. And as the day of the Lord draws near, scripture tells us it will get darker. But that darkness doesn't have to lead to despair because we have the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So our hope is, is, is tethered to, to this future glory. That even in the suffering and in the pain, I know that there's a day coming where I'll receive my crown of glory if I just keep, if I just keep the faith. Yes, amen. I keep the faith and I fight the good fight. Good. And I bring my flesh into submission and I crucify my flesh. Lest I run my race and reach the end and have missed the prize, Paul says. But there's a day coming where we'll receive our crown. So let this not... I pray, and it was by design that you would feel the weight of sin and hell, but that it wouldn't lead to despair. It would, it would place a longing for the light in you. It would place, place a longing in you again to evangelize. It would place a longing in you to share your faith because your faith is not just your best way to do your life. It's reaching people, it's reaching down into the miry clay that people are stuck in. And, and it's, it's quicksand and they're stuck and they don't know the way out. And Jesus lifts them up and sets them on a solid rock. And they have a solid foundation for their life. And there is a hope in them, Christ in them, the hope of glory that helps them navigate the despair of this world and bring heaven to earth, the kingdom of heaven, which is a glimpse of heaven, future heaven right now. So let's be those people. It's our eschatology, doctrine of end times and eternal states, heaven and hell. Hell is real, heaven is real, let's evangelize. That's the game plan, let's stand. I wanna pray for us. Thank you, Jesus. Mm, mm. Trying to tear down a share of poles is what I'm doing. You're like, crystals or tarot or I'm trying to scripture says I was reading through the kings the other day and it, it was talking about the good kings and the bad kings good kings bad kings and often it says about the good kings it says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord but he didn't tear down the Asherah poles and the Asherah poles were these were, were representations of false gods that were erected in high places so part of what this series is, is doing is I'm trying to tear down Asherah poles I'm trying to tear down these false ideologies that are being perpetuated and are coming at you on your screen by trying to give you the truth of the word. Truth is not something we design. It's something we discover. We uncover it. It's revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. And so if there have been anything in your life that you've seen in this that was like, well, I thought that about Hannah. Well, somebody told me this. I'm just trying to show you, and then if you go get the notes, there's citations and scriptures. I'm trying to show you what the church has taught for 2,000 years so that we don't get tossed around by fad preaching and fad doctrines. That as James says, that we're not tossed around to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Because there's some winds of doctrine that sound nice. You know what sounds nice to me? Hell not existing. Sounds nice. It's just not true. You know what also sounds nice? A world without gravity. I just couldn't live in a world with gravity. Well, try walking off a cliff. You can like it all you want. It's just not true. And if we believe that Jesus is Lord, then we got to believe what he said. And the person who was the most loving person, the most loving person to ever live, talked like this about hell. And we cannot, let's not dare to believe that we are more loving than he is. And he loved them enough to tell them the bad news. And, but then he says, but whosoever will come may. And check this. It also says in scripture, it's God's will that none should perish. Right. That's right. Jesus did his job. He went to the cross. Now it's time for the church to do our, to do our job, Amen. to preach the gospel, Amen. to keep the main thing the main thing. Yep. There's a lot of conversations we need to be having. I'm not saying they're not important, but people are showing up to the church going, I'm hungry. 
do you have any food? And we're talking to them about like the benefits of like a dairy-free diet. They're like, can I just, but do you have any food? Yes, we do. It's the bread of life. His name is Jesus. Father, help us. Holy Spirit, lead us into wisdom. Bring this to life in us. For, for those who are going to go from here and who are going to search the scriptures to prove it true, Holy Spirit, be with them in their questioning. As they wrestle through their faith, help them to see that asking questions is not deconstructing. It's growing. Help them ask the questions in the right way to uncover truth. Not to try and prove a point, but to really uncover truth. We would be humble enough to approach the scripture saying, I want to know it's true. And they would ask it in the right place. They would ask it of scripture. They would ask it of the church. The truth would come alive on the inside of us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Maybe you're here and you would say, Pastor, I wouldn't consider myself somebody who follows Jesus. We're going to pray. Call it a prayer of repentance. Call it a a fresh start prayer, a new life prayer. We're going to pray to receive Jesus and make him Lord. I just want to give people the opportunity to say yes. Because it's his will that none should perish. And he desires that all would come to him. It's quite simple. Walking with Jesus. It's not easy. Oof. Sheesh. But it's quite simple. We believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that he was raised from the dead and we'll be saved. And then we live our lives, we submit our lives to him as Lord and say, Jesus, use our lives to build your kingdom. It's not enough to believe in Jesus. Well, I believe, so do the demons, scripture says. It's not enough to just believe, but to make him Lord. Say, Jesus, do what you will with my life. It's an act of submission to his lordship. And so we're gonna pray. And if you've never prayed to make Jesus Lord, but you're saying, Pastor, today, I want, I, I want Jesus to be Lord. It's a crown of, of glory waiting for me. And I, I, I want to go to there. There's no mourning. He wipes every tear from our eyes. Glorified body. Raised to life in him. Yeah, that's me. We're gonna pray. I'm asking each of us in this room if we could pray out loud together. And even if you've prayed this before, the reason we do that is, is because we're just verbally joining our faith with the faith of those who are praying for the first time. It's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. It's an act of faith right. to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And so it's, it's a way that we can verbally join our faith with them whose lives will never be the same from this day forward. So we're gonna pray, I'm gonna ask us to pray. If you're praying for the first time or maybe the first time again, I would just love for you to incline your heart to the Father and pray in sincerity. Let's pray together, pray with me. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I know that I've sinned and I need you. So come into my world, be my leader, be my Lord. I submit myself to you. Make me brand new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And use my life to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen.